Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon to both our audience here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. I'm Eric Anderson, the Director of Voices in Leadership. This series focuses on the lessons of effective leadership to create positive change in public health. Dr. Patty Garcia is recognized as a leader in global health, actively involved in research and training, reproductive health, and medical informatics. She is a research professor at the School of Public Health at Chiatano Arede University in Lima, Peru. Dr. Garcia served as Minister of Health of Peru from July 2016 to September of 2017. During her appointment as minister, she introduced new public health policies in sexual and reproductive health, HPV vaccination, food labeling, cervical cancer, electronic medical records, and telemedicine. Dr. Garcia served as the Dean of, public, of School of Public Health at UPCH from 2011 to 2016, and as Chief of the Peruvian National Institute of Health from 2006 to 2008, where she introduced the first information system for the National Network of Public Health Laboratories in Peru. She has recently been appointed as a member of the United States National Academy of Medicine, the first Peruvian to earn such a distinction. We are very pleased that Dr. Garcia is serving as a Mentual Senior Leadership Fellow with us this fall, teaching a course on leadership development in global health. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Dr. Rifat Atun, please join me as we welcome Dr. Patty Garcia to the Voices in Leadership series here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Good afternoon, Paddy. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to Harvard Chan. Uh, you've had an incredible journey as a leader in this remarkable journey. What, what were the most memorable steps? Well, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. Um, you know, when I think back, um, it was not in my plans at all, in my plans for my life to be a minister. Okay? I think you don't plan what you want to be as a position, but, uh, but what you do is you should know what you really want to do in general. And, um, and one of the things that I remember all, I mean, since I was a little, is that every time I would, would see something, I would like to try to make it better. So if you ask me about what are the kind of things in my life that really probably shape um, shaped my life really. I could start probably from the time where I made the decision to become a doctor. Um, I was about five years old and, um, <laughs> and I really got very, very sick. I was very, very sick. Um, doctors didn't know what I had. They thought that it could be a lymphoma. And actually it ended up being brucellosis. A disease that at that point was very prevalent in Peru, and, um, but I stayed like four months or five months in the hospital and then other months at home. But I had all these doctors that really make me feel good. So I really decided at that point that I wanted to be a doctor to make other people feel good. And actually, I have been the first one in my family with a university degree. There were no doctors around. Mm -hmm. So from there, I think another very important uh, moment in my life was when I decided to come to the States for, actually it was not for better training. What happened is that my father had lung cancer and I was looking for a better treatment for him. But a professor of the university told me that um, a good way to do it was to try to apply for a residency and ask if I could bring my father here. So I was very lucky. I was able to apply for the residency um, I got a position, but my father died before coming here. Mm. But actually that allowed me to see a different world, you know. Another important point was, was when, and at that point, I was still wanted to be a good clinician and a good doctor. I wanted to be a hero there, okay, just as a doctor. 
until I met a person who has been very important for me, who is a mentor. I think mentors are quite important in your life. Mm -hmm. This mentor, Dr. King Holmes, who is an expert in uh, sexually transmitted diseases, he is the one who really introduced me into research and public health, and eventually global health. And one of the things that he told me is, you know, public health is quite important because with one action, you can change the life of thousands of people. And I started there. I trained at the University of Washington, but always with the idea of coming back to my country because that is something that we all have to do. I think we have to, for, for the people that are, I mean, foreigners maybe training here, I think you have to take the chance and go back to your country and do something for it. So I came back to my country and started working. I had the opportunity of working at the national program of STDs and HIV. And together with my husband and another friend, so we were several people coming from the University of Washington, we developed several things. Um, the surveillance system uh, for, the na for the nation that still works, okay? Um, all the guidelines, I was the chief of the comprehensive care for HIV and STDs, and we started to create these networks. And for the first time, I realized that the things that I was learn, I learned at the University of Washington could be placed into policy. And that was right the point in which the HIV epidemic was starting in Peru. It was an incredible opportunity also because we were speaking the same language as the cooperation agencies to try to deal, to get better deals on what we were going to do. At that point, uh, these cooperation agencies were trying to create parallel systems. But what we try to do, we push it to have a system that will work at the Ministry of Health, strengthening capacities within the program. And I think that is why still we have a very strong mm. program in Peru. So mm, we had to, we work at the government, but as it happens in our countries, um, the government ended we had the opportunity to go to the un go back to the university with this the creation of the new school of public health at the mm -hmm. university we started there and at that point see sometimes things happen right when we were at the government we wrote this big grant for uh, welcome trust to try to introduce a new model for a con the control of stds but actually because we left the government and the situation was very unstable we were able to move the grant into the university, but with the idea of creating the same thing from the university, training people and building capacities within, within uh, the Ministry of Health. And we did it. This was a, a grant that lasted more than 10 or 12 years um, with a randomized, big randomized trial that proved that working not only with formal providers, but with informal providers, like pharmacy workers. Mm -hmm. And that was one interesting thing. You could really control STDs, and we did it. But we use also the opportunity of knowing how the system, the governmental system work, creating networks, and being able to apply this into policy. Okay. Well, okay. Um, yes, I went back. I eventually became the head of the National Institute of Health. Another important point, I think, I learned even more about how the government works, how to make it work better, went back to be dean of the School of Public Health and push for training. Um, and eventually, well, one very important point has been this opportunity of becoming Minister of Health. I have to tell you that I'm very proud that I double the average time of a Minister of Health. Oh. It's hard because you have to try to do things in such a short time. Try to find those things that you can do right, like the low-hanging fruits, but try to build the roots for whatever will come next. And now that I'm back at the university, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to catch those things that had been left there and try to see how can I continue them at the university. Yes. So it seems like a very exciting journey shaped by a number of critical events in your life. But I think what's very exciting, it seems, is that you've been able to combine research, implementation, and policy. And you've been able to operate. And you're still operating uh, at this uh, exciting interface. And you mentioned the word hero. And heroes always leave legacies. What were your legacies as the minister or as a, as a leader? Well, I would like to think that being a minister has been only one, one little piece of my life. So I would like to tell you about the legacy of what I think are the legacy of all my life, okay? So the first thing is people, my students. 
Um, I think that's one of the most important legacies that anybody can have, and that's the advantage of being working within a university uh, environment. Um, I have had the opportunity of, of training different levels of students, and when I was a minister, one of the most interesting and, and important things and exciting things was to go to a place and say like, hey, doctor, I have been your student. And then some <laughs> of them were master students. How are you doing with your thesis was like the answer, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, well, I will continue. Yeah, because you have to finish, right? Or there were things like, oh, remember, I work with you at that, at, at the Welcome Trust, oh, yeah. the Welcome Trust program, or um, this Welcome Trust grant. So I had people all around that in some way were touched not only by me, by the team, because the kind of things that we have done, it's not only me. I mean, it has been a team of people that have been working together. So that's what I think people, the people that are touched by what the kind of things that you do, or by my training, or by students, are the most important thing. The other legacy, I think, has to do with the research that we have been doing, and this, this opportunity of moving research into policy. We have been able to introduce, for example, point of care testing in the country with the rapid syphilis test, which was a study that we started to try to prove that such a test could be implemented and now is policy in the country. And it had to do with understanding what physicians thought about tests, what uh, midwives thought about tests, and what women thought about tests and the needs of each of them. Oh, and the laboratory technicians too. And to try to see how to really sell them the idea, the ownership of something new that could really change things and make them better. The other thing that I would consider my, a legacy is the introduction of medical informatics in the country. Hmm. And I'm so glad because as a minister, um, we have started the introduction, as you said, of, of was said in the presentation of the electronic medical records. But I know that the introduction is not enough, okay? And that is something that usually fails when you work in the government, okay? You start something and nobody follows it. So our plan is to try to see how from the university, with training, monitoring, and giving some feedback and some support, we can help so this introduction will continue or will be and will be sustainable. So some great legacies. So students creating the future leaders or helping develop future leaders, information to help generate the evidence and policies to make a you change. Know, you know that one of my students had been the director or is, yeah, well has been the director of, of the Department of Informatics at the Ministry of Health. Oh, and now is the counselor for the new Minister of Health. Wow. So seeing your students, it's like, you know, students are like having kids of your own. So now I don't only have kids, I have also grandchildren because some of my <laughs> students are mentoring other people. And so that's another thing that has been in interesting. It's like, unfortunately in countries like mine, usually we don't have a system of mentoring people. Mm. And we're trying to introduce it at the university and because it's quite important. So you have your kids, your grandchildren, and those are the ones that are going to remain after I leave. And so at some point, I will need to take vacations, of course. <laughs> and so I hope that they will, they will be the ones that will follow what we have so started. So that's a remarkable legacy. Many children and grandchildren. Yes, yes. And many, many leaders. And it seems that you know, in this journey, you're not alone. You're, you're, you have a whole team working with you. And actually, even when you complete your journey, there'll be many others in this journey. But I told them not to tell me grandma, OK? Oh, really? Just <laughs> Patty. Just <laughs> Patty. Patty. Just Patty. OK, so coming back to Patty, you make it uh, you know, so, sound so easy. What were the challenges you faced as oh a leader? Oh, my god. OK. So, so we only have a few minutes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the main challenges um, as a minister okay, has been corruption. Hmm. Corruption is something that people don't talk, okay? Researchers, I mean, we, and academicians, we are always, you know, very at this level, and we don't talk about corruption, but corruption is something that is quite important. And there is no budget, okay, that will be enough to do things if we have corruption behind mm -hmm. it. So that, what, that was one of the big issues. The second 
prop, uh, I would consider a barrier, being a minister, implementing things, had been what I call the politics, okay? So politics that could push populistic things that we know that may not work, but uh, instead of trying to push for things that we know that work, but may not have any results in the short run. For example, vaccination, okay? If you talk about HPV vaccination, if I va vaccinate now, I'm gonna see the results in 10, 20 years. Hmm. So it's quite difficult. The third obstacle, to make it simple, um, the third obstacle is what I'm going to call the bad private sector. Hmm. Because I believe that there is a good private sector that understands that if we work together, public health and private sector, we are going to have healthy population, okay? But if, but so for certain um, public health measures, for example, labeling of processed food in order to know which ones have high fat, high salt, etc., or trying to work with the private sector to try to address all these issues that are problematic for the health of the people, Okay, that has been really challenging hmm. for me. So, so you're dealing with challenges beyond the health sector. And, and you know, with this issue of corruption, I even have a situation, I wish I could show you a cartoon in which <laughs> I look like there has been a bomb in front of me. So you imagine my hair and I will be black already. So there is a picture like that, okay? And what happened is that even at the very beginning, when I started to be minister, there was a big scandal of corruption. So one of the um, counselors of the president, who was, who was the health counselor, was found actually um, making some um, contracts to took money from the comprehensive insurance system, moving patients that were supposed to be managed at the public centers or public hospitals into private clinics. And actually there were some recordings that came out. Mm. And of course, who is responsible of everything? At some point they said the minister, right? Oh. So that's what this cartoon. <laughs> but the interesting thing, so that's how everything about corruption started, but there were lots of things. The only thing that um, actually I, I'm, I'm very glad that happened is that in one of the recordings, uh, this guy, apparently he was asked about me Okay, so like, and what about the Minister of Health? And what he said is, oh, don't worry, she's a crazy woman. <laughs> and so when I was interviewed by the media about this, and they said like, what do you think? Because that's the media always, what do you think about this guy <laughs> saying that you were crazy? I said like, well, that's the only thing that I can agree with him, mm. <laughs> okay? I'm a crazy woman, I'm a passionate woman, but for public health. And <laughs> that is what I'm gonna keep doing. I'm gonna keep working in public health. And actually I was able to, to draw the line, corruption and the kind of things that we were going to do. Yes, I mean, corruption is very difficult to manage. I mean, it, it really is uh, like cancer that really is at the heart of the society, not just the health system and many countries uh, you know, fail because of because of corruption, and the interests are very big. And you mentioned some of the interests that you had to be um, you had to challenge. So, how did you overcome these challenges? Where, where I mean, you're very passionate and crazy about public health, <laughs> uh, and you have many children and grandchildren. Yeah. that helps. But what were the main uh, factors that helped you to overcome these challenges, especially in the short period of time that you had? Yeah. Well. I cannot say that I was able to fight all the corruption. I think the big problem, as you said, is that several of the countries, I mean, I have been talking with lots of people from Latin America, and we all share soccer and corruption, unfortunately. <laughs> soccer is good, but corruption is bad. Um, but there were things that we started to do, and I think they were helpful because at, at the end, we were able to use the money much more efficiently. So one of the things is that we created an upper reporting for allegations of corruption. Hmm. And open, so people could report through email, giving us the information that we needed by phone, okay? Or they could send things in writing. And we started a system that was much more simpler. So for people not to feel, you know, threatened about 
telling us the kind of things that were happening. And actually, I ended up, um, I ended up my period having like 457 files that we sent to the office that is supposed to do all the investigations. Mm. And some of them are being right now at this point, after a year, almost a year, um, they are being analyzed. So that's one. The second thing was accountability, okay? Um, which means we opened and started seeing all the budgets and being more clear. We had this, pros uh, this process for procurement of medications, okay? Uh, we had to buy medications for around 800 million soles, which is divided by three, and that will be the amount in dollars, okay? Mm. And uh, the thing is that in order to start this procurement, what we did is we made it open. We put everything in the newspaper, in the radios, so anybody, I mean, the ones that will sell the medications could apply, and it was completely open. And actually, we were able to save 10% of the budget, 10%. Hmm. And when I was asking, because I was interested, okay, so I asked the people that were selling all these companies, the medications, I'm like, how come the prices were 10% lower than years before? Hmm. And, okay? and you know what they told me, but in confidence, okay, in low voice, they said, mm -hmm. well, that's kind of the expenses that sometimes we have hmm. in order for the system to work, okay? so. Accountability, it's another thing. But if you ask me, I think we still need to work. And maybe even us as researchers, academicians, people that work in health systems, we need to think about, about ways in which corruption can be really managed. Hmm. You know that there is a systematic review, Cochrane review about uh, actions or that, that could help for corruption? Did mm. you know that yes, there is a Cochrane yes. review? Yeah, but finally what they said is that nobody is very clear it's, what works, yeah. except, <laughs> except for having the rules that are clear and punished when you find that something is mm. wrong. And that is something also that I think in our countries needs to be improved and simplified. I think bureaucracy is a way when things are too complicated, that's where corruption can be hiding, you know? Yes. So it seems transparency, openness, accountability, as well as rule of law. So Absolutely. So nothing should go without impunity. Um, but beyond, beyond uh, what you did as a leader, clearly you're dealing with corruption, with big interests, also populism you mentioned. Who, who, who are the people who are on your side? Well, Who did you draw strength from? Well, that's, that's one thing that is important. I think um, wherever you go, I think you try to create networks, hmm. okay, and try to identify what I call the champions. And there are champions everywhere. So I was able, and this is not something that you create just when you need it. It's something that you should be nurturing from the starting of your career. And that's something that I learned and I did. Uh, and it worked from the community, okay? So NGO from the social society, um, from the, then um, from, even from the Congress, I was able to find those champions that eventually understood what we were trying to do. And they were quite helpful for different situations, for situations like this problem of corruption, yes. or when we introduced uh, reintroduced in the country the morning after appeal. So um, I have all the backup of the civil society, really, mm. of all the women that we had been working before together and knew that this was something that was important. So some of the fight was done by them. Or, as I said, in the Congress with certain things that it takes time, okay? It, say it takes time because you have some people there, they really want to do good things, but sometimes they don't understand why vaccinating is good, preventing cervical cancer is good, or um, having better labeling in food or telling people what they should be eating is, is the right thing to do. Yes, so it seems great that, you know, you mentioned one of your legacies was investing in people, students, your children and grandchildren, who then helped you to develop other legacies through these networks Th that's and through the root, support. But, but there are others that you don't really have to nurture that long to call it a student, but could be identifying this champion. You know what I learned is that sometimes the people that are 
more against you can become, can go into the other side. So mm. from the dark side to the, <laughs> to the clear side, from right? The dark side yeah. of the moon. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and, and because usually the people that are very dark are also very passionate. So you just need to turn them on your side. So identifying those people, it's quite important. Requires time, so that's one thing. You, hmm. okay? One thing that I learned is that you have to be patient. Nothing can be done in a short time. Yes. If you want something to stay, and that is very important when you, this is something that the funders should know also, right? Because funders are always asking you to make everything scalable and sustainable, etc. But for that, you need time yeah. and you need to create ownership. And this ownership, and to create ownership, not only takes time, but to identify the right people that could be the ones that mm. are transformed by what you're doing. Yes. So, and they want everything scaled up by tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very quickly. So that's that's yes. a message, guys. Okay. So we have to let them understand that things take time. Okay. But and that you have to build things. Yes. So it seems that you know your your networks as well as investing in NGOs, civil society, but also these champions, especially those who could change sides and move from the dark side to the brighter side, as well as uh, those involved in politics, you know, help to sh to address these challenges with you as part of a broader broader movement. Um, and when you did all of this, what what are the important lessons that you learned as a leader? How what would you advise our current and future leaders among the Harvard Chan community well, and beyond, of yeah. course. Well, the first thing is, um, you know, every single thing that you do in your life, every single thing that you do in your life will teach you something. So take the time to go back and think, what did I do wrong? What did I did right? And then that lesson, take it with you because it will help you for the next step. So I learned in my life that every single thing that I did really took me to where I am. And I, I know that even what I'm doing here in Harvard is going to help me to do things better later on. So that's one. And always reflect on the things that you're doing. The second thing is, as I said, identify champions. Things cannot be done alone, OK? So you need two types of help. One, the help of the champions. And the second, try to work in team. Teamwork is quite important. Third, don't be impatient, OK? Things take time. Things take time. So it's like nurturing a little plant. When you put a seed, things will grow, and eventually you will have what you need. But you, you need to be there. And um, the other thing is that if you want something to really Everybody's talking about research into policy, right? So it's not enough to do the research and write your papers. And, it's, and everybody complains, for example, and I'm going to talk now with, with the other hat, the hat of the researchers. So like, oh, those policy makers don't understand the research. Come on, sometimes we speak very difficult. So that's <laughs> the first thing. The second thing is that you have been doing your research without telling anything to the policy maker. So if you want them to really buy on what you are doing, they have to be part from the very beginning. When you're designing it, okay, when you are planning to do it, so you can get their information. That means building ownership. And then everything is going to go well. And believe it or not, they will feel that it's theirs. You know, one of the things that happened to us is that when we were introducing the point of care test, the syphilis test, we work from the very beginning with the people, with the governmental, local agencies, with the midwives, with the physicians, etc. When everything was there, one day I realized, I received a call and said, like, you know, there is going to be this ceremony because the introduction of the rapid syphilis test is going to get an award. There is an NGO that gives awards once a year to what they call the good practices in the government. And I said, like, I didn't know that. So, so I went there. And actually, the local government presented mm. the experience because they felt that it was their own experience. My team was really upset because they said, why? They didn't tell us. And it's like, they didn't need to tell us. Okay? This was our project, but this was, for them, their 
achievement. And so that's ownership. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the things that we need to yes. learn. If you want something to really be sustainable, build ownership, get all these um, champions, work in team, take time, and learn from things that go wrong. Of course, learn from the things that go well too. Yeah, so I can sort of visualize a reflective leader thinking about what's happened, what was right, what went wrong, identifying champions, working with teams, communicating, but also engaging to create uh, ownership. But it seems that you've had a really quite a remarkable journey with great legacies, many challenges, and with many, many grandchildren and children Fantastic. and many leaders. Um, would you do it all over again? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think, you know, a friend of mine, when I was offered this position, told me, have you thought about it? Because the political situation was that we had a very weak government with a lot of opposition in the Congress. And I, ha I have to tell you, I have a very hard time. I had to go twice a week to the Congress to explain everything. But it, it was worth it. It was worth it because what you can do in such a position, it's incredible. And as I said, in public health mm. and in global health, one thing that you do can touch the life of thousands of people. So I will do it again, just in case. And I think I that's, will do that's it the again. privilege of being a leader. And uh, please join me in thanking our public health hero, Paddy Garcia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.